Hello, welcome to the Minnesota Black and African Art Festival by Her Arts in Action. My name is Toria Johnson. And my name is Kalia. The inspiration of the festival was to help students of Black and African heritage increase reading skills and comprehension through books with diverse representation. But this is for everyone because we all benefit by learning more. Today, our author is father and daughter writing team, Alan Page and Candy Page. They will be reading their book, Be Loved Can Be Hard. Enjoy and please stick around for an activity, author question and answer session. Doesn't look like it, but I'm smiling. <laughs> just, <laughs> you can't see it, but it's like, I, this is just filling my heart with so much joy. So thank you again for coming. You can see it in the eyes. Okay. Look at, look at your but I'm going to have to pull down my sunglasses because they're prescription and they can barely see without them. So it's going to fog up and you'll never see my eye. It's, it's, you know, we're all just sort of being flexible here. So thank you. Um, what we thought we would do was read the book and then take some questions and um, just kind of go from there. So um, this is our fourth book. Uh, and it's called Be Love Can Be Hard, which is so true. I mean, I, I grew up with so many fears about bees and um, have just learned to love them, but um, it's been a journey. And maybe you can show the pictures. Okay. Thump, thump, thump. The soccer ball bounced back to Otis's feet in a perfect rhythm. Thump, thump, thump. Otis was so focused on the beat of the ball, he didn't notice the soft, velvety hum of danger floating in the air. He was just about to head inside for some water when he heard it. Bzzz. Otis panicked. Arms flailing, he raced to the back door. Help! Grandpa! Bee attack! Open the door! Now, Otis wasn't scared of many things, but at the top of his list, bees. Bee attack, Grandpa! Open the door! Uh, Otis, what on earth? Grandpa, bees, they're going to get me! Otis's grandpa held him in a hug. No, Otis, they're not going to get you. But Grandpa, Otis insisted, they're out there. You're okay, kiddo. Just try and take some deep breaths. But Otis could not breathe. He closed his eyes tight and pinched his body shut. Otis, bees are out there, and being stung by a bee is no laughing matter, but bees are probably more frightened of you than you are of them. Otis looked up. He'd heard all this before. Disbelief wrinkled his eyebrows. It's true, Grandpa said. A bee stings to protect its hive. And once it stings, it dies, so it has no interest in... Grandpa, Otis interrupted, how do you know so much about bees? Oh, well, when I was your age, I had a healthy fear of bees, Grandpa explained. You did? I did, and I wasn't alone. My friend Jerry and I were so afraid, we started a club to get rid of all the bees in our neighborhood. You mean your friend Farmer Jerry? Yep, Farmer Jerry. Back then, we didn't understand bees. They just seemed scary. Fortunately, we weren't successful. As it turns out, bees are amazing insects. They're pollinating powerhouses. So much of what we eat is a direct result of all their hard work. Otis's face scrunched. In fact, D Jerry doesn't run just any farm. He runs a bee farm. That did it. A bee farm? Otis knew his fun-loving grandpa was pulling his leg. It's true. The farm even has a learning lab. And sometimes, learning about what you're afraid of is the best way to face it. That way, it's not so mysterious or scary. I think it's time we paid Farmer Jerry a visit. Otis wasn't so sure. That night, a swarm of bees attacked his dreams. Supersized stingers surrounded his bed, and they were about to get him when... Bzz, bzz, bzz. Heart racing, Otis's eyes popped open. Nope, he said to himself. 
I am not going to any bee farm, and I am not going to have anything to do with bees. How do you think that's going to work out for him? <laughs> Well, a frown followed Otis all the way to the farm. But when he got out of the car, Farmer Jerry greeted him with a wide grin. Welcome to Lilyhaven Bee Farm. Even though Otis could feel Jerry's warmth, a cold chill crept up his legs as he tried to muster the courage to move his feet forward. Where are the cows and pigs, Otis mumbled. Isn't this a farm? Oh, can you just hear that sass? Like, oh. <laughs> oh sure oh. I have to say I know the story and I'm laughing <laughs> <laughs> oh sure it's a farm alright it's a farm for flowers and bees we've got a few chickens and goats roaming around here somewhere but we mostly focus on pollinators like honeybees without pollination from wind and insects there'd be no seeds no fruits no vegetables can you imagine I believe it's our job to help protect bees all bees and keep them safe. Otis found it hard to concentrate. Protect them? What about protecting me? Bees seemed to be everywhere, taunting him, buzzing out a warning, telling him to stay away. He scooched closer to Grandpa. Visitors are often worried about being here, Jerry went on. But that's normal. No one wants to get stung. Bee love can be hard. I remember when your grandpa and I wouldn't dare go into the backyard, let alone a bee farm. Let's, keep, let's get your beekeeping gear on. It'll help you feel more protected. Otis gave Jerry a doubtful sideways glance. Noticing Otis's hesitation, Jerry bent down to look Otis in the eyes. Just remember, stay calm and breathe. Try taking a few slow, mindful breaths and repeat the words, the bees do not want to sting me. Heading to the meadow, Otis paid close attention to the bees and his breathing. The bees do not want to sting me. The bees do not want to sting me. The bees do not want to sting me. As the bees floated on the gentle breeze, dipping in and out of flowers, Otis noticed his body relaxing. Unexpectedly, he also realized that the bees weren't taunting him. They were simply beautiful. If you look closely, you can see balls of pollen gathering on their hind legs, Jerry said. Otis was curious, but he still didn't want to get too close. He took a deep breath in, let a deep breath out, and then bent down. Wow, he marveled. The wooden hives were electric with activity. The bees were busy, and Jerry was busy too. While he prepared to open a hive by using a bee smoker to calm the bees, he explained that all 50,000 bees in the hive had different jobs, protecting the hive, cleaning, gathering pollen, feeding nectar to the young, making honey. Otis liked the sound of honey, but the number 50,000 made him want to faint. 50,000 bees in each hive? Jerry pulled out a frame covered with bees. It was filled with honeycomb and drifting with honey. If you're lucky, you may catch a glimpse of the queen. A sharp eye can spot her larger body, but there's only one, so... Deep breath in, deep breath out. The bees do not want to sting me. As if in a trance, Otis watched the busy bees buzz and dance and work. Jerry asked if Otis wanted to hold the frame. Otis was calm like the bees, but his hands shook slightly as he surprised himself and nodded. The bees ignored him as he took hold. He almost didn't hear Jerry whisper, There she is, the queen. Otis couldn't believe it. With each breath in, his, he his fear breathed out. Amazing. Back at the learning lab, Jerry took time to answer Otis's many questions about bees. Yep, it's true. 99% of all honeybees you see are female. About beekeeping, if you respect the bees, the bees will respect you and about honey. Yes, honey really is basically bee barf. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> Otis and Grandpa giggled as they tried several sweet samples. The frown that followed Otis to the farm that morning had been replaced just like his, be just like his fears. Smiling, he asked Grandpa, he, smiling, he asked, 
Grandpa, can we come back? Grandpa and Farmer Jerry shared a smile. Any time, Jerry offered. While Otis still didn't want to be stung, he now knew that bees didn't have any interest in stinging him. They had other, more important jobs to do, and so did he. And that is the end. Even though you're at home, give a clap to Alan Page and Kenny Page for the work they put into Be Love Can't Be Hard. Now we will do an activity inspired by the book. Art and writing projects are a great follow-up to reading to help increase comprehension and retention. Kids, make sure you have your parent, guardian, teacher, or nearest adult for permission to use supplies and workspace. In this story, be love can be hard. It's a play on words. The student in this video took inspiration of getting over the fear of bees and being amongst the beauty of the flowers with the bees. This is a pencil drawing. We want you to create a piece of artwork that is inspiration from the story. And it can be just a pencil drawing or use an art material of your choice.
So it's what you mean. Picture or video of your work and tag us across all social media platforms at Her Arts in Action. After reading the book, I bet you have some questions. Let's see what authors Alan Page and Candy Page have to say when they chat with her Arts in Action founder, Sarah Drake. Awesome. You can post questions for the author. I would like us to welcome Miss Cammie Page and Alan Page. I remember you as a purple people eater, most recently a Minnesota um, Supreme Court justice. So thank you both who are both here as authors. But before we get into the author piece, um, I would like you to just kind of introduce yourselves to us. You know, where did you grow up? What are your hobbies? Like, who are you? Let us get to know you. You want to go first, Cammie? Uh, sure, I'm Cammie Page, and I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I grew up playing soccer and reading and just being really active. And I try and stay pretty active now. I've, I, I guess I would used to, I would say that I used to call, consider myself a runner, but now I've found a joy in walking. I think maybe COVID had something to do with that, just like slowing down and enjoying all the different neighborhoods in the city. Um, and I am currently a second grade teacher. Wow, yeah. bless you. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, thank you for having us. I'm Alan Page. I grew up in Canton, Ohio. Uh, one of the youngest of four children with parents who impressed on me and my siblings the importance and value of education and particularly reading. And um, father of four, grandfather of four, uh, as you noted, I played professional football for the Minnesota Vikings and the Chicago Bears. And I had the great fortune to serve on the Minnesota Supreme Court. Four is a big number. I don't remember your jersey number. Was a four in that too? No, 80, 88. Okay. Multiple of four. Right? Well, four times, you know, adding, okay. Um, well, thank you for introducing yourself to us. Um, to get us started on the books, so how many books have you written, either individually or together? Well, would it be just, I mean, a coincidence that <laughs> <laughs> it's four, <laughs> there's something going on in the universe? I guess. We're going to have to look up what, in numerology, what that means. <laughs> yeah, so we have four books. The first book is Alan and His Perfectly Pointy, Impossibly Perpendicular Pinky. Which is a mouthful, but if there's the, there it is. There, okay. There's the perfectly pointy and possibly perpendicular pinky. Yeah, and it just is about a story about um, Alan, uh, this Alan, who enjoys, and actually in real life, enjoys going to elementary schools and reading um, to classrooms and talking about the importance of education. So he goes to a classroom and there's this little boy who just is a little bit impulsive and can't you know hold back his questions but then alan sort of you know gently appreciates him and values him and still um you know gives him the respect that you know little children um deserve and our second book is invisible you which uh talks about differences that we have in ourselves um normalizing differences in others and it sort of creates a language for celebrating differences and honoring differences and appreciating differences um our third book is grandpa allen's sugar shack grandpa allen heads up in the north woods with his granddaughter and they make maple syrup and then our most, most recent book is be love can be hard about um the importance of uh, respecting bees, uh, even though they are a difficult insect to appreciate. And in addition, overcoming our fears. And overcoming learning, them. learning how to deal with them. Yeah, growing up, it was definitely like, be afraid of bees, kill them, you know, that kind of thing. It was never, and that's why we're in the situation we are now is, you know, it was never this 
love bees kind of thing. So yeah, when I saw this book, I'm like, okay, <laughs> we have got to include this one because it's a very important topic right now. So did you co-author all four of the books together? Yes, we, we work together. Um, we collaborate on the ideas behind the books. And then um, Cami does a first draft. I'm the editor and we go back and forth until we think we have a book that we're proud of. So what's that like? Yeah, well, what's nice is that, you know, in a partnership, we, I think, balance each other out really well. Um, I am more the creative flowery language type and he has a real legal background and it's real, you know, succinct and precise and every word has, you know, deep meaning. Um, and so we, I think each better um, each other as writers uh, as we work together. And um, it's just been so much fun. I mean, I get to work with my dad, so it's like such a joy. And I would echo exactly what Cami said. In addition, we're lucky enough to have an illustrator who is here in Minneapolis that we get to meet with, talk with, and collaborate with. And um, I think between the two of us and our writing and um, our illustrators' illustrations, we're, I, quite frankly, we're having a lot of fun. We have, you know, occasionally, I wouldn't say disputes, but disagreements on um, words or word choice or how to say something. And we sit down and work it through. And, you know, I don't have any monopoly on the right answer and neither does she. And we, we, we try to do what is best for the book. And that's also seems to be kind of some of the themes in your books too of, of modeling that. So were you gonna say something else, Cami? Oh, I was just gonna say we're working on a fifth book. And you know, while it's you know fun and enjoyable, but sometimes, you know, I think this fifth book is gonna be called Grandpa Allen uh, takes Cami back to the drawing board. <laughs> 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 that's because it's not on four anymore <laughs> that's right that's right something was wrong uh maybe we'll go through four rounds of revisions and four <laughs> rounds of edits and um yeah, I, hope not, you know, I, I do make cammy a little crazy with my um editing because i will edit until i think it's absolutely right and I'm like, it's good enough. And he's you know. <laughs> good, good enough isn't good enough. Yeah. Got you. So tell us about Be Love. You know, what's the book about? And maybe in, in whatever order seems best, because maybe it's best to talk about, you know, what inspired it. Maybe that's better first. Either way, the inspiration and what it's about. Yeah, do you want to go for that or? You can go. Um, well, there are many layers um, connecting back to what you said earlier. When I was younger, I was in kind of an anti bee club with my neighbor, and we would, you know, hide under our deck and clip, you know, insecticide coupons, you know, from Walgreens or whatever, which is just terrible, right? Um, but as a second grade teacher, most of my curriculum, uh, my science curriculum is insects. And we study monarch butterflies and milkweed bugs and mealworms. Um, and then in the spring, we study honeybees. And there is just a real, I mean, it is a real fear that kids have and adults too, um, but they are such important pollinators that um, we just sort of felt like this was a really important story to tell. Um, it's okay to be scared. Uh, often we're scared of things that are unknown. And so mm -hmm. learning about the things that we have a fear of um, will help us overcome those. And um, I think that the book really illustrates that point well. And we have a friend who has a farm uh, down near Jordan, Minnesota, and he's a beekeeper. And he invited us oh, three or four years ago to visit his farm and uh, see his beekeeping operation. And it was really kind of idyllic. 
in this wonderful pasture uh, with the bees and the flowers. And um, that's kind of what inspired us. Yeah, and the character in the um, story, Otis, um, he goes down to see Farmer Jerry, and Farmer Jerry is the, the beekeeper that we actually went down to see his farm. So they do exist in Minnesota even. Well, I um, the neighbors to my parents are beekeepers. It happened, of course, once I was an adult and gone, so I didn't get to grow up. Otherwise, I would have had a very different um, experience, but yeah, they are around, and um, as one with uh, seasonal allergies, local honey is a good thing, so any of you struggling with allergies right now, <laughs> local honey is a good thing. So in addition to like bees are important, um, you have kind of a play on words also of bee love and talking about kindness and other things. Was there any experience from real life that kind of helped inspire that part of the story? Um, add? Gotta think about that one. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. Our, our stories are grounded in real life, but not necessarily specific instances. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say a theme, but in all of our books, we try to show people being um, kind and and um, oh, I'm, I'm searching for the word compassionate mm -hmm. Empathetic. with each other. It's such an important thing. So I can see why you include that in, in I haven't read the other books. Um, in, in, so, in a natural way and not in a forced or exactly yeah mm -hmm. you know we I think we try to to articulate the world we'd like to live in and be a part of right that's very good so with the theme of the book have you either you know, a social media read or in real life at readings talk to, have you heard um, any reactions uh, from kids, adults, and um, is there a reaction maybe that you haven't heard that you're hoping to um, hear? So what's kind of been the reaction and how is that, you know, Sometimes you hear just a certain thing and it's like, oh, I wasn't even going for that, but that's what they got. Any of those kinds of things? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think almost like, you know, like you had um, mentioned, you had just recently published a book during COVID. We too, um, this book was published um, in 2019 and was it 2019? 2020. 2020, yeah, I'm losing my time here. Um, and so we haven't had that many events, um, mm -hmm. not, not a book launch or book readings. We, we had one at the um, Landscape Arboretum and um, yeah. one just delicious ice cream store in North St. Paul that just they always <laughs> love. Um, but it, it has just been very well received. Um, and I think the more that we open up and go into classrooms and do more events, we probably will have more uh, to share about that. How, or maybe have there been some reviews for the book that have come in where somebody's been like, you know, I used to be afraid of bees and I'm not now or anything like that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, I think it helps nudge 
people in the right direction. You know, I mean, I don't know if immediately it's not like the miracle, like, you know, people are like, oh, right. yeah, please, I love them, I'm going to start beekeeping. But, you know, they do, you know, it opens, it opens a lot of people's minds, I think. And it makes yes. people aware, you know, you don't sometimes think about, you know, bees that they are so important to the foods that we eat, to nature, um, to so many things. And I think it's something that we take for granted. And just, you know, I think a lot of times like see a bee and it's like, you know, we swat it and we're worried and we don't want to get stung, but really they have no interest in stinging us. They're just protecting their hives and um, doing their job, so. And, and I think that th th there's a surprising amount of information as an example, the, the point that Cami just mentioned, they don't have any interest in stinging us. Indeed, when they sting us, they die. And so they actually have a disincentive to stinging. And so I think that comes as a surprise to some people, yeah. unexpected. We think they're, you know, mean and out to get us and uh, just looking for a place to to sting us, but that's not the case at all. And I think that's a, a bit of new information. I was also going to add, I think some feedback that I've had um, is that in the back of the book, so this is a fiction story, probably mm -hmm. really, fiction, but in the back, we do include quite a bit of nonfiction information. We, we include a lot about honeybees and what, you know, what they do. And um, I think a lot of people have appreciated that there's sort of a balance, you, you know, for this to the younger ones who like fiction um it also can combine some nonfiction as well for those kids who are you know real fact oriented and <laughs> right and for the adults who need to unlearn They're those right. behaviors <laughs> exactly yeah 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 so um with the focus of this series being on black and african students and trying to increase their interest in reading through representation and improving comprehension. Um, I wanna ask you a couple of questions and think about your younger self. So elementary, middle school, high school, um, you know, based on your experiences as a child, what advice would you have for a new reader or someone who just doesn't like to read, says, I hate to read? What advice would you give that person? Younger you, what do you think? I think I would, I would tell myself to be patient with myself. Um, reading is something to enjoy. Um, and so you might not find um, a particular genre um, you know, maybe you haven't read a mystery that you might really love yet, or maybe you haven't read the comic series that you might really love, um, that there are books out there for everyone and, um, to keep reading different stories. Um, and then also I think in addition to different genres, uh, different modes of reading, right? Um, when I was younger, audiobooks were not really an option, but I love being read to. I love read aloud in classrooms. Um, and so finding books on tape or audio books or um, other modes of reading, having, you know, partner reading or, you know, trying to find um, other activities that, you know, might be more of interest earlier I, on. Just be patient. I, I would also, in addition to being patient, I would, I would say, you know, Use your imagination. Mm -hmm. Include your imagination in your reading. And, you know, one of Cammie's daughters, uh, Cammie's daughter, when she was young, young, she would pick up books and just start telling stories <laughs> as though she were reading the book and connecting to it that way. And I think that's a, a good way to get children to connect with, connect with the book, connect with the storytelling, and eventually the reading will come. And so many, like that. so many stories are told in pictures, even just like, you know, reading the pictures, that's a part of reading, you know, I and to know. honor that. Um, you know, it, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, indeed, you know, with our books, I, I mentioned the illustrator, David Geister. His 
illustrations say much of what we can't say mm -hmm. because you're limited in, in the number of words you can uh, include, but the illustrations are part of that reading process. There's so many inferences you can make and so many predictions you can make and so much of your understanding oftentimes comes uh, your comprehension is helped by the pictures. So, and sometimes you have an Allen page that you're co-writing with that edits the words out too. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's like what I was thinking when you said oh, that. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and if someone is struggling, right, or like thinking about, I remember you, Alan, said that you enjoyed reading when you were younger. Um, not everybody's like that, but even if you enjoyed reading, um, you know, what is something that you know now that you would say to your younger self, like, hey, reading will give you this, or you get to experience this, or what's something that you didn't maybe recognize or notice when you were a kid that now you, you know about reading? Oh, it's it, one thing that is clear to me is that reading helps you process information. It helps you think critically. Whether, it, whether it's the words on the page, whether it's the artwork, whether it's the combination of the two. And it's, it's a way to learn and learn how to think without sort of being there and learning. You know, you're, you're, you're just reading for entertainment, but in the background and in when you adding to your foundation is this, um, analyzing what's going on in what you're reading and well maybe this will happen maybe that will happen and if so why and wh why not and why did this happen and why did, didn't that happen all of those things build on um, who you are and how you process information i think that's critical and i never would have understood that i just thought reading was about you know enjoying the reading well and i think you which it which it is but there is okay. so much more mm -hmm. i was just gonna say you have said um quite a few times uh that whether it's a playbook in football or a legal argument you know in your judicial career um the reading that you did early on has helped you immensely you know so it's not just for the yeah, it's not reading isn't just for a specific set of person people it's what mm -hmm. whatever you want to do in life reading helps you right. prepare for that absolutely yep. did you have any thoughts you wanted to add beyond that cami no oh, i think i'll leave it at that <laughs> okay thank you was there an experience or time in your childhood where you learned that language or words or reading had power? Or maybe you were a little bit older and that'd be fine, but a time where you recognize that though that words are, have power. You know, for me, um, maybe intuitively I knew it all along, but I never thought about it. Um, Although my parents, when I think back on it, my parents used to always say uh, when somebody would uh, say something mean to me and I'd get all upset, they say sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. And eventually I understood that to mean you have the words give you power mm -hmm. and somebody else's words you can deal with because you have the power with your own words. And then um, I think I really later on in life, I really started sort of fell in love with working with words. And um, we all laughed back when, um, you know, I think it was um, 
President Clinton when he said it depends on the definition of what is is? Well, it does depend on the, what the definition of is is. I mean, precision in language, in word usage is critical. And I certainly didn't understand that as a child, at least not the way I understand it today. You know, but you can you can use words in a way that give you power. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna talk about my diary from when I was little. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was I, you know, I I get sweaty palms and my knees shake. And if I have to say something in front of someone, it's really often very hard for me. But if I could write it down. Um, or say my thoughts, you know, in writing, I just, I found it so freeing. And um, for me, like I've got notes everywhere now. And I just, whenever I'm feeling the feels, sometimes I just have to write it down. And for me, that has just given my, like, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I just feel like it's, it's just a freeing opportunity for me to feel less stressed about what's coming out and, you know, gives myself, I give myself some power um, with the written word that way. Those are both great answers. I had to remind myself as Alan was talking of like, wait a minute, you're not just watching something like you're hosting this thing, like <laughs> stay with it. Cause I'm like so drawn in. And then you, what you just said, I think is really powerful. And I, I haven't heard others give that advice to our students yet of the power of that. So thank you both for um, those answers. They're very powerful. Um, you mentioned there's a fifth book that you're working on. Um, can you tell us some about it or no? I know sometimes that's not possible. Um, we can. I don't know. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we're we're self-published. All of our okay. proceeds, all the proceeds of our book go straight to the Page Education Foundation, um, and so uh, I don't think there's any liabilities or anything for us. <laughs> there are some secrets. Uh, what we're playing with is uh, I have a big pollinator, well, it's not a big yard, but in the front of my yard in the city, I have um, pollinator, it's a big pollinator garden, mm -hmm. tall grasses that grow up to eight feet, big blue stem and prairie flowers, sunflowers, and it's just this wild mess. Um, but we're trying, I'm, I'm trying to, I feel like there's always a good environmental message in some, well, not in all of our books, but in some of our books, and I'm, we're trying to figure out a way to um, just inform uh you know the community that you know again pollinators are super important and um it can be fun to help support them many of our students watching know about pollinator gardens rain gardens storm drains and things like that so um that would be very cool and my son encourages it because we don't he doesn't like to mow the front yard so yeah it's like just keep digging up the pod keep going mom keep going you're yeah. saving the world yeah so you know it'll be i think it'll be fun and so then that'll be five so plans to just keep writing and adding to the what you got yeah yeah no reason not to yeah. And, and as I say, we enjoy working together and we enjoy the end product. And we think they're, they add value to those who read them. Exactly. Is there a topic that you haven't covered yet that maybe you haven't even talked to each other about, but just where you're like, you know, you've got this wild idea that you know maybe we should write a book about this you maybe it'll never come true but any yeah. thoughts out there you want to share your latest idea which i think is just lovely which one was that um well, <laughs> you know the saying it takes a village to raise a child but sometimes it takes a child a child to raise a village um, oh that just gave me goosebumps oh, oh. Okay. We need, we need that one. We need a book in the world, but just trying to, you know, write it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I think it, it could be powerful, a powerful. I think so. Yep. 
So tell us about the Page Education Foundation, if you would, please. Well, my wife, Diane, and I started it back in 1988 with the goal of encouraging, motivating, and assisting children of color in Minnesota to pursue post-secondary education. We do that two ways, one by providing financial assistance for Minnesota kids graduating from Minnesota schools going to Minnesota post-secondary institutions and programs. More importantly, we require those we give grants to, to work with young children, kindergarten through eighth grade, as tutors, mentors, and role models. Sending the strong, clear message both by in person and by deed that education is important, that it's a tool that you can use to achieve your hopes and dreams, that those young children get to see somebody using that tool, that our scholars get to work with young children and give back to uh, help those who come behind them. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been doing that now since, say, since 1988. We have more than 8,000 paid scholars wow. that, we've, uh, that have gone through the program. And uh, we're pretty proud of them because through that, their serv that service component, we are literally changing the future. Well, it's not just those 8,000, right? It's all the right. lives that they touched also. And exactly. So, you know, we have this notion that athletes are heroes and that we look up to them. Well, um, the reality is that we're influenced by those we can reach out and touch. And not many of us have the ability to reach out and touch an athlete. But our scholars can be reached out and touched by the people in their communities, by the children they work with. And that makes all the difference in the world. And it's gonna, it, it, it is not only going to, it, it is and will continue to have an impact uh, today, tomorrow, and into the future. Well, so it is about 30 years of lives that have been affected, wow. Very impressive. Well, thank you for that work and what a great way to honor your wife as well. Um, anything else? Is there anything we haven't covered or something that you want to leave the students with today? I, I would simply say as young people, you have a tremendous amount of power that your education and particularly reading enhances that power and gives you control, puts you in charge of your future. And so read as much as you can, write as much as you can. And you know, not everybody's gonna be an author. Not everybody's gonna be a great reader, but everybody can get something out of it. And um, I think when you apply yourself, and, and I would say seek excellence, not for the sake of being better than the person next to you, but for the purpose of being your highest self, everybody wins. I mean, how can I top that? <laughs> mesmerizing even to me not to this. You know? yeah how do you get any work done <laughs> No, you're a school teacher. Um, thank you for that work. I mean, even before COVID, there's no way you could have paid me enough money to work um, with young, young, young kids in a school. And so with, in addition to everything that's been happening, um, thank you for the work that you do. Um, but I'm sure you have some bits of wisdom to, to share. Oh, um, do you know, I mean, I'll just piggyback off of what my dad said is that just that the future is yours. Each and every one of you has an opportunity to reach out and grab it. 
And um, like I said earlier, you know, don't feel the weight of the world on your shoulders if you haven't found the passion for, for you know, reading or whatever it is in life that you, um, that fills your heart with joy. Um, you know, keep working and um, you'll find success. Yep. Thank you both so much. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you to authors Alvin Page and Kimmy Page for answering our questions about their writing book, Be Love Can Be Hard. We hope you're as excited as we are. This is actually made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Central Minnesota Arts Board. Thanks to the legislative appropriation from the Arts and Culture Heritage Fund. Thank you. The Minnesota Black and African Author Festival is also possible because of her arts in action and the generous sponsors. Thank you to the African American Employee, Employees Research Group at Central Care, Hire Works, collaborative with the Bush Foundation, Apiary Coworking, Voices, Voices Black Business Resource at Group at Capital One, and Brandon Up International. Help the authors make sure their books are in as many libraries as possible. If you don't see their books in your local library, Please request it. Thank you for tuning in. Remember to keep reading.